First off, I'd like to emphasize that the United States government may indeed use actors when it comes to Sandy Hook. They may indeed use actors on site at places like the Boston Massacre. These actors are involved with genuine fatalities. The United States government does not care about killing its citizens. Remember what I've told you. In the time of the Empire of Rome, when you were a Roman citizen, that was the most important thing in the world. To be a citizen meant that you could never be enslaved. To be a citizen meant that your word was as good as the emperor's. Now, in terms of the United States, due to the American GI generation, uh, which you may admire, and I would encourage you to admire, individuals from that generation for their courage, mostly in the military, for their service, uh, but uh, when it came to the civilian population as a rule, and much of the military as well as a rule, the majority of that generation was repugnant. Now, I've done my best to emphasize the fact that when the Japanese were interred, the United States Navy, to its eternal credit, registered a formal protest with the United States government because they had been overseas – their servicemen had seen the Japanese, dealt with them personally. They knew that the Japanese here were honorable and were honorably committed to the nation in which they had sworn allegiance to as United States citizens because they had been citizens here for over three generations. Uh, it would be like a samurai marrying into a rival clan. At that point, the samurai's allegiance is to the clan which he is married into, not to his bloodline. That is the attitude that the Navy knew the Japanese would take. But once Order 9066 was issued, executive order uh, as issued by President Roosevelt, and all of the American GI generation said, go for it, then your citizenship ceased to have any meaning. Because Italians and Germans who were considered Caucasian, at least the Germans were, many people in the United States at that time, as hard as this is to believe, Italians were considered by most Americans in the United States to be a colored race, similar to what many Americans uh, today consider Mexicans to be. Now, Mexicans and Latin Americans consider themselves Caucasian, as did the Italians of that day. Well, the majority of the Anglo-Americans in that day and age weren't having it. And Italians were considered uh, colored enough where when they cobbled together songs like Mambo, which is obviously a Latin dance, there is a song you can look up called Mambo Italiano, where the Anglo-Americans in their cultural arrogance uh, just basically cobbled together this concept that Italians and Latin Americans are just basically all the same. They're all somehow brown. So uh, in terms of what we have with the internment of the Italians, that was done very smoothly. Nobody complained. All these were U.S. citizens. Also, when uh, American citizens, and there were many who fought on the side of the Italians and the Germans, were captured in the United States, brought to the United States, they were tried as enemy combatants. Your U.S. citizenship ceases to have any meaning when you are counted as an enemy combatant. Well, obviously, it ceased to have any meaning when you weren't an enemy combatant because they took Japanese, of course, who were not military involved with the overseas conflict and stuck them in concentration camps, forced them to work as slave labor. So being a U.S. citizen is meaningless. The reason I go through that long, uh, dive, that, 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 shall we say, uh, Sir Kurtz's route to uh, get to the point is because it is so necessary to explain to you that as far as your U.S. government is concerned, you are an enemy combatant. All of you, all of you U.S. citizens are. So as far as they're concerned, you're there as their enemy to oppress. Your only purpose in life, like a sheep being sheared or a more appropriately, a cattle being led to the slaughter, you are basically there for them to collect taxes from you to support their lifestyle, and that's the only thing keeping you alive. And anytime you want, they can take any number of you out and kill you for their own sacrificial reasons. So believe me, there are actors involved at Sandy Hook. There are actors involved at the Boston Massacre. And there are people killed because they don't care whether you live or die, and they have no qualms about killing any number of you. And if they could get along just as well without you, they'd kill you all. End of story. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no excuses. But they need you, so don't resist. 
the system will collapse on its own all too soon. And by all too soon, I'm emphasizing the fact that when it collapses, we're going to have millions dying anyway because of the lack of infrastructure. So whatever you do, pay your taxes. If you resist in any way, resist passively. And by passively, I mean just avoid them whenever you can. Don't cooperate with them. Don't look them in the eye. Don't join their recruiting campaigns. Don't join their military. Uh, the FBI comes in area. You run away. <laughs> Stay away from them. There is nothing good that can come from them. They are not your friends. They are the KGB personified. They're worse because with the KGB, they were honest. And you knew they were going to take you into a room and electrocute you until you talk. With the Bureau, they say, we're your friends, and they kill you with a smile. So the end result is there is someone who died at the Boston Massacre. That is the young blonde jogger who is pictured on the Illuminati card. Now, that Illuminati deck is turning out to have more and more significance than anyone would want, despite so many of the precautions that we need to have whenever we turn towards that deck as a kind of tarot deck of upcoming atrocity. And uh, Mike Ringley can speak well to that. He's done a lot of research into Steve Jackson's Illuminati deck, and uh, he was kind enough to uh, basically give out some information, which I read on air with our last uh, episode. And I do tell everyone to please refer back to our last uh, episode of uh, Critical Omissions, where I spoke of the Illuminati deck due to uh, questions asked by some people. And, of course, uh, our last uh, program for Saturday Night Firing Lines had to contend with the birthday of Solaris Blue Raven, who I hope is enjoying her uh, personal new year. But in terms of the analysis of the crime scene itself, um, yes, Mr. Becker and uh, Mr. Ringley, and, of course, by now, thousands of other people, uh, are quite right about the blood. Now, I was educated at the City College of San Francisco uh, in forensics uh, photography. I was My major was criminology and criminal psychology. Uh, my instructors, just before they retired, were quite elderly. They were the same people who taught Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the black pope of the First Church of Satan, uh, his trade in forensic photography. Uh, which he learned so that he could become a criminal photographer for the San Francisco Police Department and thereby evade the Korean War era draft. Ironic. See how all of this is historically connected. We're talking about Korea, talking about the threat of Korea, talking about the Boston Massacre, talking about forensic photography. What is it that these individuals uh, basically taught me about forensic photography at City College of San Francisco? Well, in those days... We all used black and white cameras, and the black and white cameras were used because of the very reasons that Mr. Becker articulated. Blood looks like blood at any crime scene, no matter what, and the color of blood at a crime scene is black. And there is no need to see that blood in color because it's going to look just as black in color as, as it does in a black and white film. Pretty much. And uh, as a matter of fact, in black and white horror films of the golden era of the silver screen, what they would use was chocolate syrup. Chocolate syrup was the closest that they could come to looking like congealed black and white blood on a black and white screen. That's how it looks in a crime scene. If you really want to fake a crime scene professionally in the good old days when we were still using black and white film, which was until very recently in criminal forensics, at least in the city and county of San Francisco uh, that I know of, then uh, you would be using chocolate syrup on site the crime scene. Now, of course, nowadays everything is in color and the blood they were using just didn't cut it. The blood they were using apparently looked quite red, did not oxidize. Now, what Mr. Becker was saying about the man with his legs blown off, now, 
he's absolutely right. What makes that phony is that they would lay the man down in a supine position and put his leg up. They would jut his leg up even if they had to hold it up or prop it up uh, to keep it from bleeding out because you can die in three minutes like that. Uh, probably far less. I mean, really, you burst a jugular vein, one of the main uh, veins in your leg. I mean, you bleed out pretty much in a few breaths, really. Uh, the blood pumps out very violently, um, and uh, as I have personally seen, uh, and you, you effectively, you die immediately. Uh, there's, you, you have some consciousness. You live not long enough to really give out a uh, anything in terms of uh, last minute will and testament because you go into shock from the pain, which is overwhelming. So the idea of the man sitting in the wheelchair where he would be bleeding out, uh, bone sticking out and all that and looking like uh, the way he did, um, it's not absurd in the pain sense because they can shoot you up with enough painkiller. Uh, and there are always paramedics available at these marathons, uh, plenty of paramedics on site. Plenty of security on site. That's not the suspicions, not the security, not the paramedics. Uh, they can load you up with enough pain where even if your legs were blown off, oh, you could die happy. I mean, you'd be soaring with your guts falling out of your your stomach. You, you could have your intestines unraveling on the ground, and they can kill your nerves and make you feel good about it. That's uh, not the problem. The problem is, of course, the bleeding out. So – and uh, so that covers it all right there. Now, I've got something here from Noreen Helpan, my lovely secretarial assistant. Uh, tell Doug he was right to say people died in Boston, etc., since we have to remember that while other things were done to create illusion, such as photos, people died. Otherwise, if people only believe in the fake photos, they don't respect the fact people died, which is happening on the Internet with inaccurate headings in regard to the photos of the Boston incident. Thank you, Noreen. Mwah. You are loved, as you well know. And um, she said she had some very entertaining dream about me the uh, other night, probably uh, some uh, prophetic dream that I would die on air while choking to death on the granola bar uh, while Becker made me laugh to death about uh, the uh, poor dude in the wheelchair who probably, as has been stated, was an amputee uh, from many years ago who had uh, blood uh, placed on him to look as if it were a genuine accident. And that is exactly the case that we've seen with uh, some of those victims. However, uh, people did die because without people dying, they do not get their sacrifice. And uh, believe me when I tell you, this government and most of its elite that is involved with civilian or military pursuits often veers towards the satanic, quite literally. And in terms of what we can see with the result of anything that happens, it would have no meaning to them if people weren't dying. So the act of creating the effect of the circus, creating the delusion that people are not dying, this is the same complicated situation which most people in America, because America is only a few hundred years old as a constitutional republic. People were here, of course, since the 1400s that were of European descent. That entire history was swept under the rug by this totalitarian constitutional republic. And people are no longer identifying themselves as Americans, which were here of European descent for hundreds of years before there was a constitutional republic. And they're identifying themselves quite delusionally uh, as United States citizens. And you've got to learn to think of yourself as an American first. And your U.S. citizenship is basically a meaningless formality. Because the Americans are young as a culture as opposed to so many, basically everyone else in the world, whose cultures span back thousands of years. Americans think, as a culture, like infants, everything is black or white. The adult world is a million shades of gray. They faked moon landings using Stanley Kubrick. Uh, our friend uh, Thomas Wiedner is quite right about that. And they had this 
staged setup so that they could have good footage of astronauts prouncing around on lunar landscapes because it's very difficult to get good footage on the moon because of lighting, uh, which is either too dark, you're either in total black or you're in total white out because the sun is shining directly on you with no atmosphere to dilute it. And uh, photography in either situation is almost impossible. So they knew that good photographs on the moon were not technically technologically possible for that day and age. They took genuine footage of when they were on the moon, but you can see how it looks. It's very um, primitive looking. So they did a bunch of staged mock-up landings to make it look good for propaganda reasons. And their mistake was that now that that's gotten out, the public is so cynical and understandably so, it uses that footage to dismiss the fact that man landed on the moon. Well, we landed on the moon, and we also faked landing on the moon. It's a complicated situation because it's an adult, real-world situation. Now, it's the same with the Boston Massacre and Sandy Hook. You had people who are actors, and you had people who died. That is the true horror of it. This is the satanic element. They want you to disrespect the people who died because that is part of the satanic bent of the sacrifice. That is what happens when they sacrifice people satanically, is that if they can get you to dismiss the suffering, the death of those people, then they've won completely because that person has died and to you, their life and the sacrifice of that life has no meaning and no impact. And because of that, they can do it again and again and again. And you're always going to dismiss it. And you're always going to say, that means nothing. It's not real. And they'll kill people right in front of you. And you'll say, it's not happening. It's not real. And then they'll kill you. And when you die, everyone's going to look at you and they'll point at you and laugh and say, you're an actor. That is how it works. So I want you all to respect the fact that at all of these incidents, people are dying. And they want you to not believe it. And they're going to make sure any way they can that you don't believe it. So... Why? And in this case, what it was, was North Korea. North Korea had America by the balls. They basically had the ability to kill you all, to take you all out, to take me out as part of the population of the United States, more than likely, statistically. And uh, basically, they made their demands, uh, ratchet down on harp, like I said. Maybe they could have the crops turn up next year for the first time in 20 years or if the Americans can't stop HARP, which I suspect to be the case then the Americans have to supply at least the ruling dynasty and particularly the military which could overthrow that dynasty with all the food that they want and various other commodities and the Americans of course surrendering to these demands basically had to turn the American public's eye away from those demands, set up the Boston Massacre. That's why only a few people were killed. I mean, if it were a real terrorist act by North Koreans, by someone who was truly of evil bent or of a mindset to get something done, why do some chicken dip bombing at the finish line, which almost nobody reaches? (laughs) I mean, you're talking about half a million people Sometimes run marathons like Beta Breakers in San Francisco or the Boston Marathon. The overwhelming majority of them are never going to make it to the finish line, have no intention of reaching the finish line. Uh, So putting a bomb at the finish line is the last place where you're going to do massive casualties. So optimum casualties would be bombs all up and down the street. You take them all out. Then why stop there? Why not just do something to take out Boston, period? where you've got a million people 
who would otherwise not even be there, just there for that specific day, really do something. I mean, if terrorists really wanted to do something, they could do something that would truly knock your socks off and collapse the American economy, which in turn would collapse the world economy. It's that fragile. Bam. And uh, the truth is nobody is really thinking like that or would have happened. The American government got together and they said, oh, we'll kill a few people, get this thing going. Everybody turns away. And you might say, well, why can't they just ratchet it down? Why can't they just, uh, you know, say, stop talking about North Korea? doesn't work like that because if they stop talking about it, alternative media will continue talking about it. So they've got to do something to get everybody talking about something totally different. And in this case, it's the Boston Massacre. So the Texas thing – uh, the explosion probably was a genuine terrorist and had nothing to do with this because you don't hear about it. I'll give you an example. Like I was explaining to James Arthur Yanchik, as I talked about last time, about Joel Hendricks III. You've got an individual who basically converts to Islam. He is an American citizen. Okay, we'll be right back after the break. You stick with us. And I do want to address what Mr. Becker was kind enough to text to me. He did say, uh, may, but mainly Doug knows they have to pay these actors off. How do the actors go out in public after their faces have been exposed and most are now known as fake photos? How do actors explain this to people who recognize them? Just wondering, I think it's an important factor. Actually, that's from Noreen Hel Helpan, my lovely uh, secretarial assistant. And uh, yes, like I said, uh, I'll be anxious to hear what kind of uh, bizarre dream she had about me and uh, some other character in there. Probably, I may not even actually want to know now that I think about that. She left me some taunting uh, hints on uh, the answering machine about that this morning. At any rate, uh, I do want to say, Noreen, excellent point, and here's the point. Uh, it doesn't matter because nobody cares. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, um, Christ, it must be a decade ago at this point, my dad and I were watching a uh, UFO uh, documentary, quote unquote. This was supposed to be real footage from a family that was under siege from alien attack. Now, this, of course, was a television special that was a takeoff on reality TV where uh, a supposed family was in an isolated home that uh, had aliens. They were under attack. A number of them died. Uh, there was a analysis that looked very compelling uh, concerning psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, sociologists who were shown this footage and asked to analyze it. I remember one of the most um, poignant and uh, um, compelling or uh, com uh, bits of commentary came from an African-American child psychologist. Uh, he was a man who said what is most disturbing about the film is that the only person who seems to have her act together is the child and the family. Everyone else seems to be panicking, and yet the child every once in a while will give out an order or bark a command, and they all obey it subconsciously as if she is somehow in command, and for some reason she's maintaining an awareness or at least a detachment from the situation – that is very disturbing, and uh, so that added some compelling uh, uh, atmosphere to the footage when you were watching it. Now, Mr. Becker, do you have any memories of this special uh, that was on? Now, I'm going to make my point with I, this, but I'm just saying, does any of this ring a bell with uh, I you? I have seen it. Okay, so do you I've remember the title? Uh, do you, do you no, I don't even remember the name of the family. Uh but it was quite interesting, and it was awe-inspiring, if you know what I mean. It does grab you. Yes, yeah, it was done very well. I, I mean, it wasn't – I mean, when you look back on it now, because it was done in the 80s, even then there was an aura of camp to it. And if you look at it now because of the way it was done and our current sophistication – our rather jadedness would be the word for it. Our current, current jadedness with reality television, I believe most of us would look at that now and, and think that it was campy and, and amateurish. Uh, but for its time, it was rather pioneering. Um, it was prior 
to Blair Witch Project. So uh, it did what Blair Witch Project could not do, which was actually pass itself off as real. And uh, so the, one of the individuals, who was obviously a professional actor, obviously they were all actors because it was not real, one of the individuals uh, was spotted in a supermarket and uh, somebody called into Art Bell. Now, during the time that Art Bell was still on the air, uh, this was the 90s. People were calling in, claiming it was real, claiming that they knew it was real. Uh, Art Bell was very neutral on it, and Art Bell being a professional, uh, as he said himself, very geared towards entertaining his listenership uh, and, and somewhat of a professional about it. He was neither going to deny or confirm uh, whether or not he knew it was real and kind of just wanted to let the listenership speak out about uh, their, res their, their resonance, how it, how it hit them. And uh, one of the guys called in and said, look, I saw this guy personally after he was supposed to be dead. I saw him die on that video. Then I saw him shopping in a supermarket, you know, and so I know that the video is fake. And so this guy was bringing this up casually. That didn't stop any number of other people from saying that the video was real because the rationalization could always be presented that this man thought he saw that actor in the supermarket, that he did not know him personally. He didn't know that, that whether or not that was someone who just happened to favor him in terms of appearance. It's the same thing with these actors. The majority of actors know if they're a professional actor as opposed to someone who's delusional, the majority of actors know their careers are never going to go anywhere, that they're going to spend the rest of their lives as extras, that if they get some opportunity to do something like Sandy Hook or the Boston Massacre and the government pays them off, that that is the best, fattest check they are ever going to get in their lives of quiet desperation. So there's not an actor in the world who is at the bottom rung of acting who is not going to jump for that because they also know it will never threaten their careers because no one will recognize them. And whoever does will simply be told, oh, that was someone else. You're mistaken. Uh, that person just simply favors him. There's plenty of people who look like me. I mean, um, right. I, I take a look at myself in the mirror, and how many times have I been mistaken for Johnny Depp? I'm just kidding, but uh, uh, I have had people uh, compare me to, uh, unfortunately, Lou Diamond Phillips, which, uh, at any rate, I digress. So the point is that uh, all that's going to happen to these people in terms of their acting career is nothing. It's not going to interfere with it at all. Most of them are going to spend all their time on theater stages where nobody statistically is going to see them. So that is exactly what happens. It's just another job. And um, here's the unreality part of it. Like I've mentioned before about when I went to a uh, police academy in San Francisco, and uh, when I was uh, – no, not the film. I know it would make a great comedy series uh, if it were part of it, but – uh, no, unfortunately, none of the women in the academy look like the ones that are in the film. Uh, these were bikini babes. Uh, most of these were uh, what um, I guess the term that we would use that would be rather neutral would be <clears throat> butch. But at any rate, uh, again, I digress. So the point that I'm making about one of the things that we were shown in the police academy, actually, you know what? I'm mistaken. That was from a security training program that I was part of, but it was the same kind of environment. It was a security uh, training establishment. Uh, so what had been shown to us was a bank robbery, and this was actual footage from bank cameras, which, of course, are always running for obvious reasons when the bank is open and when it's not open uh, 24 hours a day. And these bank cameras caught on air a bank robbery where a off-duty cop who happened to be armed, as uh, in those days all off-duty cops were required to be armed 24 hours a day uh, by the overwhelming majority of constabularies. Those rules have since changed uh, because it can be quite a psychological burden to have a firearm with you at all hours. Uh, but <clears throat> in this case, the... Um, peace officer was in line, and uh, what happened was that Steve Travesty wrote Walking Dead. I have no idea what the devil he's talking about. Um, so, uh, but anyhow, going back to – you know, he seems to have an almost sexual obsession with The Walking Dead. I'll have to talk to him about that. <laughs> in fact, The Walking Dead could provide the makeup too. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Travesty. Um <clears throat> Uh, at any rate, um, I'm, I feel like one of them right now. Uh, but um, to go back to the bank robbery, 
there was a line of people waiting for service from a teller. The line of people included a pregnant woman. Uh, the line of people included a mother with a baby carriage. The line of people included the elderly and included the young who were with their parents. Now, a man was in line who apparently was writing a bank robbery note. He did not look as if he were normal or behaving normally. Now, police officers are very good at this. They deal with nervous people all of their lives. They know when someone is tense. They know when a situation is unnatural. And he looked over the guy's shoulder and saw he was writing a hand-me-all-the-money note. So he proceeded to grab the man and proceed to try to cuff him and detain him. The man turned around, pulled out a firearm. The cop grappled with him, and they were involved in a life-and-death struggle right there on the spot, a life-and-death struggle in which the police officer was able to get out his own firearm and shoot the assailant through the chest. Now, all the while that this is ongoing, Everybody in the bank turns around and circles them and watches in giggling glee because they assume that an action film is underway and that these are two actors being filmed. Now, this is in the 90s. This is way before 9-11. This is way before False Flag became a part of the American vernacular. And even then, Americans were bug nut effing crazy. There's nowhere else in the world that would happen. Anywhere else in the world, an overwhelming majority of the world, when I was down in Managua, the capital of Nicaragua, people think in a fashion that is entirely alien to Americans. People think like this. They think, oh, I got to make a phone call. I better make a phone call now because if I wait till later, the line might be down. Now think about what I'm saying. Is there a single American you know where in a million years that thought would enter their head? I better make a call right now because if I don't, if I don't do it later, if I wait till later, the line might be down. That's because most people in the majority of the world live in war zones. And somebody could cut the line in an attempt to, co to cut communications to the local police department. They could blow... Uh, the line uh, in an attempt to cut off communications with the capital, etc. Americans don't think like that. Americans don't live in reality. Americans live in fantasy. And the very idea that Americans are so bug nut effing crazy that they could not realize that somebody's going to film something, that they would notify people about it, that they would set up, say, for instance, roadblocks so that uh, cars don't trolley into the area while you're trying to film an action sequence because if you've got actors running out of a bank, as what ultimately happened with the bank robber who was shot through the chest, he ran out of the bank. He lived because the police officer did not have what I would consider to be a man's gun. He had one of those rinky dick little ladies' guns that was a nine millimeter. <laughs> and it went. Basically, I believe it or not, if I remember correctly, pretty much through the heart of the bank robber, he lived another half hour at least. He got into his car and was able to drive away several blocks before he expired. Now, in terms of the – aside from making commentary about the stopping power of a 9 millimeter, which as far as I'm concerned, it has none. I would never want to be hit by it, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I hope that the story I relay makes my point. But the point is, other than that, the fact that all of the Americans who were there in that bank have no concept that if they're going to do a film and you've got actors running out of a bank, if you don't have a roadblock up with police, cars could trolley in that area and hit people running out of a bank onto the street that are pretending to be robbing a bank running out onto the street. And kill them. So whenever they film something, they pass out warnings days in advance. We're going to be filming here. They set up a roadblock. They get police. When a film is going down, there's lights. There's – you know it. 
And I know this because I grew up in the city of San Francisco, even though I was born in a foreign nation, where they film the majority of the world's car chases for Hollywood because San Francisco is a grid overlaid on a city of hills. So with all of these uh, car chases, you see what I'm talking about, barricades, police, notices passed out for days beforehand, filming will be done in the area. Okay, so I have that level of sophistication that maybe these people didn't. They still can't be forgiven because there should be some common sense involved. Who would have the cameras? Where are the cameras? There were no cameras around other than those affixed for security for the bank. So these people, what world were they living in when two men with guns are struggling in a bank and pregnant woman, woman with baby carriages, everybody just surrounds them and stares at them and giggles and says, oh, wow, this is great. Oh, man, I'm going to be in a movie. That, my friends, is pathology. That is insanity. That is your entire American view of history is on the level of that bank robbery insanity. You are living in something that's happening and you think it's a fantasy. And when you live in a fantasy, you think it's real. So you take that bank reference and then you go to Joel Hendricks III, who I brought up. Now, when Joel Hendricks III, who is obviously Caucasian by his name, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if I remember correctly, he was uh, some kind of uh, Colorado Springs native, lived in Oklahoma City University. Uh, he got Islamized by his dorm mate, who was from Pakistan, and he built a very uh, fragile, unstable bomb out of, if I remember correctly, uh, something that was like acetone triperoxide. And or triacetone triperoxide, if I remember correctly, and this is a highly unstable um, element or series of elements, combination thereof. He manufactured it in his own home at suicidal risk. Uh, same ingredient used in the London bombings of July 2005. And on October 1st of 2005, he put on all of these explosives on a suicide vest. Uh, he had the Taliban beard. He had uh, the um, uh, Shaba. Uh, he had the kafia. He basically was uh, dressed the part. He went over to the Oklahoma City Stadium where a football game was going on Saturday night, October 1st, 2005. And to honor and avenge the 10th October 1st anniversary of the condemnation and incarceration of the blind sheikh who first attacked the Twin Towers and to celebrate the Bali bombing anniversary of uh, October 1st, he was going to blow up everybody in the stadium and he could have done it there were 85,000 people it was 7 20 p.m and half a dozen times he tried to get in he bought a ticket and he tried to get in and the security guards wouldn't let him through because of how he looked good for them and he said they were racist he said that they uh, were religious bigots uh he was dressed the way he was he had every right to be dressed the way he was and they said no it looks like you're carrying bombs so they turned him away, and he tried to blow up the Norman, Oklahoma Disease Labs Research Center on site the Oklahoma University. Now, as I said, he got halfway there, and his bombs were so unstable that he blew. And when he blew, they could hear the explosion four miles away. It rocked the stadium. People thought they were lobbing mortars into the stadium. And the tree half a mile away from where he blew – was filled with ball bearings and nails all throughout its bark. So not only that, he blew out all the windows in the microbiology lab. He never reached it, but all the windows shattered from the force of the explosion. Now think about what I'm saying. Had he been in the middle of that stadium, he could have taken out 85,000 people, not just by the direct explosion, but by the panic stampede that would have happened afterwards he probably would have had more people finishing themselves off, stepping on each other to get out of there than the people he initially killed, which he would have killed hundreds. I mean, this would have been remembered. But this was the explosion muffled around the world. You never heard of it. And one week later at Georgia Tech, basically they experienced a plastic bottle detonator's premature explosion that killed the janitor who picked it up. And the explosives 
that the janitor was trying to clean up because he saw a bunch of plastic bottles full of an identified cleaning liquid or or drink. He didn't know what it was. When it blew up and killed him, there were enough explosives left all over Georgia Tech where they needed to be control detonated. And uh, the same thing with the dorm that this student uh, lived in. They had to blow the entire dorm that was loaded with all these uh, hydrogen peroxide explosives, highly unstable. They had to basically demolish that wing of the dorm in a controlled explosion because they were so unstable as explosives they couldn't even remove them off-site to control detonate them. So uh, none of this you ever heard. Why? This was 2005. There was plenty of reason with the war in al-Iraq to say, look what the Muslims are doing to us. Well, the U.S. government doesn't want you to know what the Muslims are doing to you. And, of course, it is not the Muslims, but rather radicalized elements thereof. Nevertheless, that radicalized percentage out of a billion Muslims is 100 million. That's a lot of people who are willing to go to these lengths. So the U.S. government doesn't want you to know about this. They suppress it every time. And here's why. They say, this is U.S. government for you. They say, we can't let people know that people can do this because then they will want to do it. If you let them know some guy can do something like this, then everybody will do it. And they don't have the capability to exploit it for propaganda. There's too much inertia involved. The U.S. government has to plan it in order to exploit it. If it wasn't them who planned it, they can't exploit it. They don't know how. They don't have the machinery in place. So some random terrorist does something. The odds are you're never going to hear about it. They suppress it to prevent panic. If you hear about it, the government did it. That's the general rule of thumb because they've got the machinery in place to exploit it. That's why they say they just built Bluden's – they just – excuse me. <laughs> they just blew Building 7 before Building 7 collapses. That's why they say we're going to build up a memorial to this horrible tragedy before the tragedy happens. And that's why you see the machinery in place to condemn the American militia – before Oklahoma City bombing. This is why the U.S. government will create these atrocities. They're more than prepared when they're prepared. And that's why you hear about it. If they don't prepare for it, you're not going to hear about it because then the entire machine goes into overdrive to suppress it. So that's why Joel Hendricks III was an honest terrorist. So you can look him up on the website. Probably has his own Facebook page, even though he's dead. Uh, H-E-N-R-I-C-K-S, if I remember. Joel Hendricks III, his parents, of course. You'll probably find a website set up by them to make him look like an angel. But at any rate, he's for real because they suppressed it. You take a look at these other dudes that are um, the saps, these Chechenians. That they've dragged out of nowhere. First off, it's ridiculous that the Chechenian, because, oh, and I love this part. I mean, uh, I think uh, James Arthur Yanchik said this best. They were pointing out their motivations for bombing people in Boston at the marathon. And, well, apparently on their blog spot, they said, yeah, I feel alienated. I don't relate to any Americans. That sounds like something I'm saying on radio every other day. That sounds like something James Arthur Yanchik would say. That sounds like something my producer Thomas Becker would say. <laughs> there's there's very few people who even listen to alternative information media who, if you asked them, how do you feel? I doubt there's very few of them who wouldn't say, I feel alienated. I don't relate to most of my uh, – to, to most Americans in the United States. I, I, I think that would be the norm at this point in history. So, uh, if anything, that would probably be a sign of mental health. Uh, well, that's hardly a motivation uh, to go out and bomb someone. So, what is the politics behind it? 
Then they say, well, look, they're Chechnyan. Well, in case you don't remember, George Bush Jr. brought the leader of the Chechnyan resistance into the White House and did a Ronald Reagan. Just like Ronald Reagan brought the Taliban into the White House and said, these Mujahideen freedom fighters are the equivalent of our founding fathers in America. So Bush brought the leader of the Chechens, who were responsible for the Bolshoi massacre in Moscow, where they took over the Bolshoi theater with suicide bombers, and Vladimir Putin had to take them out with spetsnaz and gas that basically killed half the audience in order to prevent all of the audience from dying. So we've got the situation where Vladimir Putin, if you want to know why he feels cold on the U.S., Think about Bush bringing those Chechens who took over the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow uh, were hurling suicide bombers all over the Moscow subway and brings them into the White House and says, these guys are the equivalent of our founding fathers in the United States, just like Ronald Reagan did with the Taliban. There is no reason for the Chechens to attack or bite the hand that feeds them, as with the Taliban. I mean, when these dudes are so blatant about their support for radical Islamic fundamentalist insurgencies. This is why you don't have that much radicalist fundamentalist insurgency taken on the U.S. with terrorist attacks other than what's happening. you got plenty of it you never hear about, Joel Hendricks III being a preeminent example, and the only reason he stands out is because he's white. You've got uh, a few other kids like that, Johnny Walker Lynn, uh, enemy combatant, uh, now rotting in jail the rest of his life. Um, his U.S. citizenship has ceased to have any meaning, which means he just joins the rest of us in line for that. Now, in terms of all of this, you never heard of him again. Anybody who is really doing something that would empower the public in terms of what they could do against the government, you'll never hear about it. So if you hear about it, it's government. Pretty much, that's the black and white. After that, it goes gray. So, when I talk about ignorance in history, here goes another example of it, which I think is very fitting. One of the greatest leaders that ever lived, an Arab leader, Jamal Abdu al-Nazir Hussein, known to the Americans as Gamal Abdul Nazir, uh, died in 1970. Here goes an individual who basically was able to preach pan-Islam, pan-Africanism, and pan-Arabism, and manifest them all in one personality. He ruled not one nation, but two. He was the president of Mysore Surya, meaning Egypt of Syria. And at that point in time, Egypt and Syria were not separate nations. Under his leadership, they were one single nation, known as the al Jumuria, al Arabia, al Mutahida, the United Arab Republic. And here was an individual who not only stood off the world by nationalizing the Suez Canal, but basically was able to force the Americans to do what he wanted, force the Israelis to do what he wanted, uh, a lot of this had to do with the Nazi technology, uh, the uh, what was known as Area 333 in the ruins of Heliopolis outside Cairo. And what he was able to do with that technology as a lever, just as the North Korean dictator, Lil Kim, is able to do with the technology that he was able to muster, World War II era technology from the Japanese initially, which they have since perfected. The Americans were first saying, as Mr. James Arthur Yanchik observed, the Americans were quite correctly observing the fact that this was World War II era technology, uh, so mild in terms of its atomic output that they tried to dismiss it all as just high concentrations of TNT. But if they're able to put what they did into a satellite, trigger an EMP, 
they can do to the United States what the Soviet Union, with an arsenal of literally thousands of intercontinental ballistic missiles, could never do. And they brought Uncle Sam to his knees to the point where Uncle Sam had to kill a few of you to take your attention away from his surrender to North Korea. So, Nazar's connection to all of this is another example of hidden history. What a lot of people don't know about in terms of Egypt is that there is what is known as the Halayib Triangle. And I believe it is no longer on maps. As a matter of fact, it is considered a historical cartographic anomaly. And, uh, of course, it is known as Burtavir in Sudan. And this was the situation. Egypt claims a bit of Sudan beneath the demarcation line. And the Sudan claims quite a bit of Egypt above the demarcation line. And what are these blebs or little dots in the sand that go above and beneath the demarcation line created by the Brits when they retreated from Anglo-Egyptian Empire, what they used to hold as Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Basically, two little nations that you never heard of, and um, you'd have to look up on, say, a search engine search, the Halayib Triangle, spelled H-A-L-A, and an apostrophe I-B, I believe is how it's anglicized, and the Halayab Triangle is, again, connected to another so-called neutral zone above the Wadi Haifa in Sudan and beneath the Aswan Dam, south of the Aswan Dam in Egypt and north of the Wadi Haifa in Sudan. And uh, both of these were once a nation known as Ichi. Now, what was this mysterious little nation and what function did it serve to the world? that you've never heard of. Basically, what had happened was when the Sars family was martyred in the prison, uh, excuse me, the consecrated church uh, that was taken to, now known as the Church of the Blood. You can look that up as well. If you do a search engine on the Church of the Blood, we're not talking about a DC comic location uh, that plays host to an imaginary cult. We are talking about an Orthodox Christian consecrated sacrificial burial ground for the royal family. And his imperial highness, the Tsar, the emperor of uh, Orthodox Russia, was murdered there with his family years after they had abdicated the throne by the communists. Now, one of the family, the her imperial highness, the Grand Duchess Olga, the eldest daughter of the last Tsar of all the Russias, Nicholas II, was supposedly not murdered at all. And uh, with the other members of her family, uh, towards the end of 1917, she was supposed to have escaped from the palace of Zorskoli Salo, where they were being kept prisoner initially before they were taken to their execution. And she was supposed to have been helped by the French governess, Vera Lyubov. And the two women uh, made it out of the chaos of Civil War Russia to relocate, as so many exiled royal families do in England. Uh, where the Kara Georgievich dynasty of Serbia uh, lives in exile to this day, who I myself contracted to security service to during the height of the secession wars in the former Yugoslavia. But uh, what happened was that when she was in England, she had en route married a young Romanian, uh, Constantine Komeno, and they had dreams of reinstating the imperial throne of Russia and reconquering the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Komeno himself uh, liked to delude himself as being deemed the last emperor of Byzantium. Now, this is a common objective in Orthodox religion, by the way. So it's, I'm being a bit extreme or a bit harsh, uh, but I'm assuming that uh, this individual did not have the bloodline that he claimed, but the idea of the liberation of what is now Turkish-occupied Constantinople uh, is common uh, as an objective amongst all Orthodox Christians. Now, they made a living essentially out of forgeries, uh, forging documents. 
Uh, this is how I got to know about them from the records of document destruction, uh, document verification, uh, document disputation that is so much involved with researching historical documents. And, of course, ultimately, when you're finding the real ones, if you're involved with the United States government, the Soviet government, you destroy them. So because of that, I ran into the concept of document alteration and document destruction as a science. Uh, I'm probably more familiar with it than most people out there are even familiar with. Uh, I've got some clown on uh, the uh, YouTube who basically uh, was ref referencing one of the uh, DVDs that was uploaded – uh, by uh, an individual with the information machine, which uh, provides a great service in terms of helping to get other uh, YouTube videos circulated through their own medium. And this individual was claiming that the Chochoa do not exist, which is, of course, absurd since you can look up the language and anthropologically verify it. You can ask any special serviceman who was with special forces in the old days of the Vietnam era, and they will tell you about the Cho Cho being universally recognized in Southeast Asia as the death spirit. And I've got some clown on YouTube saying, oh, I have a friend who works in California as a law enforcement agent specializing in basically Asian crime. And this individual's never heard of the Cho Cho. Uh, well, you know, all I have to say to that, Stephen J or Stephen J, uh, is, uh, I guess the last name is either for jerk or jack off, uh, is basically, first off, give me that dude's badge, number, his name. He should turn himself in and resign from law enforcement immediately. Uh, now, oh yeah, he's California law enforcement, works on an Asian gang crime, never heard of Chocho or the Asian dwarf crime loans. Yeah, Asian dwarf crime lords, yeah. And uh, what a clown you are, Stephen J. Uh, if you can't give me the guy's name and badge number, then uh, obviously if you're there to protect the guilty. And he says, the CIA brought Chocho over from Vietnam because they look like children? When do dwarves look like children? Excuse me? Obviously, you've never seen children with Methuselah's syndrome. Obviously, you've never seen many dwarves who are suffering from other ailments aside from dwarfism who look very infantile while they're bipedal. And these were being brought over as children quite successfully. And Douglas claims, this is according to Stephen Jay, he heard the Laotian screaming and dying of Soons, so the unexpected nocturnal death syndrome. How is that? If you are dying in your sleep, you go to sleep and don't wake up. No streams, no snoring. And, of course, Stephen Jay, I'm certain, has survived the ordeal to tell us all about that. You dumb, disrespectful, little wanker. Yeah, I would hear them dying while they were sleeping. Now, this is part of the fantasy I'm talking about. How the F can these people talk as if they know anything? And they're the first people to speak online and say that someone is, you know, discredited because they simply refuse to believe what they say. That is the kind of situation we were dealing with with the document forgeries when uh, I was contending with this case of the nation of Ichi, which is spelled I-C-I. Most people have never heard of it. And it existed in the Halieb Triangle that uh, this young lady wound up at. The Duchess Olga basically uh, started blackmailing the British government while she lived in London. They forged a famous letter from Zinoviev to the British Communist Party, which Stanley Baldwin, the British Prime Minister, ably used to obtain his clamorous victory over labor in United Kingdom what we would refer to here as an American Communist Party. In Britain, it's called labor. Uh, furthermore, um, she had the brilliant idea afterwards of blackmailing the British government, threatening to reveal that Baldwin's victory was the result of a forgery. So to avoid scandal, His Majesty's government consented to hand over to Olga the jewels of the Empress Mother of Russia, who had been entrusted to, which had been entrusted to King George, on the condition 
that uh, she leave Europe forever. So uh, she basically left and lived in Alexandria in Egypt for a time. And uh, a brilliant young man, Felix Rallo, a good friend of the Romanian officer Constantine that she had married, uh, basically had a very decadent passion for royalty and for pleasure and uh, introduced her to King Fald of Egypt. And he presented the Grand Duchess Olga with a pavilion in his castle of Monteza as a gesture of welcome. And uh, they easily convinced Olga, uh, who was known as a Madame at the time, uh, to basically transform the pavilion into a gambling den. And the cream of Alexandrian society swarmed into this casino, and it became very similar to Monte Carlo. Ministers, administrators of the Suez Canal, even the king himself, money flowed like champagne, and scandal became a real threat to the Alexandrian aristocracy. So Russell Pasha, the cousin of the Duke of Bedford and the head of the Egyptian police department, advised the king to grant Madame a piece of land as far away from the capital as possible, in which she could be absolute ruler and where she could give vent to her passions and receive her friends without threatening the integrity of the Egyptian state. And uh, it was remembered that there was a palace built by the Qadi Abbas in 1860 on a small peninsula in the Red Sea that had lain semi-abandoned for years. So you may or may not find the ruins of the palace principality on that uh, coast of the Red Sea. Uh, you used to be able to have travelers that uh, could actually view the sand dunes that had overwhelmed that particular architectural wonder. And I believe it's all lost to the sands at this point. But uh, the idea of forming her own principality entertained Made Olga. So the immense palace pleased her, even though it had been half invaded by the sands already because it had been abandoned from the 1860s. And uh, so she had it cleared up by uh, an army of Egyptian servants. Uh, labor is quite cheap uh, throughout the majority of the world. And uh, she called her um, Ice, I-C-I. I don't remember what the relevance of that was, to tell you the truth. I do know that 100 Thelahin were called to clean the rooms, repair the roofs, build new terraces, plant a garden. The only real problem was the lack of water. Uh, the nearest spring lay some 30 kilometers away in a small bay hidden behind some rocks where a Coptic monastery had been established centuries before. But the dexterous use of young women and blatant menaces decided the monks to move and settle amongst their brothers in the Wadi Natrum, a desert east of Alexandria. And a huge fortune was spent to bring the water to the palace. A vast number of workers were smitten by sunstroke and disease in the process. But after about three months' labor, water trickled again through the groves and the courtyards across the many rooms down the walls of the hammam and into the marble basins. Now, the king's uncle, who preferred Madame's realm to his own, presented her with many pieces of costly furniture, uh, to which he added part of the imperial Russian accoutrements bought from the Soviets, actually purchased from them with American dollars, and paintings, books, and bric-a-brac that she had known as a young girl in Pavlovsk and Tsarskoye Selo, returned at last to the hands of what was supposedly their legitimate owner, and a host of servants were employed. And uh, the men were dressed in white robes on which the golden imperial eagle was embroidered. And the women, those from Catholic schools with the very best references, were hardly dressed at all. And when everything was ready and the first flowers bloomed in the garden walls and the mirrors were hung in the palace, they basically invited Ichi to all the most corrupt from Heliopolis to Petra. And foreign libertines visited Madame's realm, the viceroy of in India, I believe was a frequent guest, if I remember the records correctly. So were certain Latin American politicians. Uh, basically, Madame let them choose all the companions they preferred. Expert young girls or tireless black men with the detachment of a true monarch. And under the emblem of Imperial Russia, a sable eagle on a yellow field, her court became a deluxe whorehouse. And transvestism became one of Ichi's fashions. And uh, notables from uh, San Francisco, of course, became uh, quite in vogue there. Uh, Truman Capote was a visitor. Uh, certainly there was uh, all kinds of other leaders from all over the world. And they were all filmed, and they were all blackmailed, uh, being involved with young men who were dressed as women and young women who were dressed as men. So all of this ultimately faded when Nazar invaded, 
and you never heard of it again. One of these days, I'll give you the detail on that invasion. But uh, you take care. In the last few minutes of the music, uh, I do want you to remind us, uh, remind you to check out feet2fire.com for that uh, that interview I did with James Arthur Yanchik, and he'll have the video up later during the weekend. But he's got the audio up now. Thanks so much. Take care. <laughs>